The reason we're in this business is to change lives and to help people. I was diagnosed with learning disabilities, ADHD, I mean, you name it, all the acronyms. I didn't know what any of that stuff meant, but as I was getting older, I was getting diagnosed with more things, if you will. And there, I saw guys having issues and problems, but nobody ever talked about it. Where was this when we first got married? Because we struggled. I didn't tell her about the baby call or the fire that somebody got hurt in or the car that we had to cut someone out. I started going down this dark road. I went to this hole. I fell in this hole. I went down. I went dark. It got really bad. Like my whole body was in a cold sweat. And by the time I retired, I wasn't sleeping four nights out of the week. I started seeing things during the daytime. I envisioned ways of committing suicide. My wife doesn't need me. My kids don't need me. They're adults. The department doesn't need me. I can't go back. I have no identity. This has been such a journey. I tell people I'm still, I'm still on this journey. It's the first responder, the first to get the call, the first on scene, greeted by God knows what, pushed beyond the limits that they don't even set. Then what happens? You're listening to After the Tones Drop. We're your hosts. I'm Cinnamon, a first responder trauma therapist who founded our practice after seeing the need for specialized care following a local line of duty death. And I'm Erin. I'm a first responder integration coach. We help first responders receive transformational training, therapy, and coaching. Now we come to you to explore, demystify, and destigmatize mental health and wellness for first responders. Our show brings you stories from real first responders, the tools they've learned, the changes they've made, and the lives they now get to live. Before we jump into the show today, we wanted to be mindful of the mental and emotional well-being of our listeners. We'd like to warn you that some individuals may find the content of some of our episodes alarming. Please be prepared to hear content regarding PTSD, suicide, and other content which listeners may find troubling. So I'll just start by saying, welcome, Tim. We are... Super He's pumped here. to have you on the show. You're one of those guys that's like, you meet and we got to know you. I will just say <laughs> real quick about Tim. I saw him from across the room because he's a gigantic man and he stands out in a crowd and he came up to me, approached me and shook my hand and said, I am tall Tim. And I said, well, I am short Aaron. <laughs> so that was our introduction, <laughs> but we're so happy to have you. Absolutely. And I know Erin got to meet you first, but she ran over to me and she's like, you got to meet this guy at this next table. And I was like, which one? And that was the end of any discussion of who Tim was, right? <laughs> like it was, he is the one closer to the ceiling. Uh, and just whether it was talking to you one-on-one -on -one or in a group or watching you talk to other people, your enthusiasm is contagious. Like you're the mm -hmm. kind of guy that you can watch. And you just get a smile on your face watching you because it translates. It's like this ethereal thing with you that oh, your you. passion and your kindness and your investment in what you're doing just radiates. And it was really cool to just... You're making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we got it yeah, on recording. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm so honored to be one of your guests. I'm really looking forward to it and it's going to be, be a lot of fun. And I had so much fun with you guys and meeting you at the one RC there in South Bend, Indiana, and just been looking forward to this. It'll be fun. Well, great. Yay. We like to have a good time. We tricked him. <laughs> you got him convinced. Yeah. He, he's been duped. He, he believes, he believes the rhetoric. Yeah. No, I love your guys' podcast. You guys do a great job and the interviews you have and everything are just fantastic and your guests. And so yeah, I, it's a real honor for me to be here. Well, we take that as a strong compliment. I think that given that we're all the way over here in the Middle West and, and you're a West Coaster and have created something so phenomenal and so powerful and literally like 
rise up from the ash kind of Phoenix development of your organization to have you say that we're doing good works. And yeah, Absolutely. it means a lot. And changing lives. I mean, that's why we do this, right? The reason we're in this business yeah. is to change lives and to help people. And, you know, I did that in the fire service for 44 years and absolutely loved it. Then I had this opportunity to be able to do it even more. So. Well, and that's exactly why we are excited to have you on here because you have that experience yeah. and it's really hard to change a life if you haven't had the experience. That's mm -hmm. what makes it work. Yeah. Being in the trenches and understanding the hardships that come along with not only your career, mm -hmm. but in life in general is how we can create and provide value for others moving forward. So sometimes yeah. it takes the school of hard knocks, if you will, to be able to offer that to folks. Absolutely. I got some hard knocks that I can tell you about. All right. <laughs> I think that one of the most powerful things that you bring to the table is so much experiential wisdom in terms of mm -hmm. You know, we can sit and talk about what we've learned from you all or what we've read in books or got out of trainings. But this is why we have first responders on is because what we have to say only goes so far. And sometimes that's not very far at all with some people. It really is getting the people who says, I've been where you are. I've thought those thoughts. I've had those experiences. And even with all of that said, it's not this idealized level of recovery and mental wellness that is not achievable that we just kind of put on this pedestal. But you are one of those examples of how it can go from, I didn't know what it was. I didn't want to talk about it once I knew what it was. And then now this is where I am and I'm running an organization. I'm retired. I'm talking about it on podcasts you're moving your feet to help the guy that comes behind you, the gal that comes behind you. So they don't have to suffer in silence as long as you and many others did. Mm -hmm. I really, really appreciate what you said there because I want to help the next generation. I don't want them to go through what I've gone through. I want to make sure that they get tools and the resources that they're going to need. It's not a matter if they want them or not. It's they are going to need them in order to have the career that they want to have as a first responder. And keep the family they've wanted to create while absolutely. working through that career. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes when I'm asked to come and speak to people, they'll say, hey, we want you to feel free to interchange with the audience and stuff. And I'll walk in the room and, you know, here's tall Tim and all that kind of stuff. And then I'll just come out with a question and I'll say, how many of you are in a relationship? You know, and everybody raises their hand, right? And then I'll say, okay, how many of you are in a relationship at home? And 90% of the people are raising their hands. And I'll say, how many of you want to stay in that relationship for the duration of your life? A lot of folks raise their hands. I mean, there's still, there's some that will lower their <laughs> like, hands. I don't know about know? this one. Like, I'm they're trying not, to get rid of that one. I'm, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about this one I'm in right now, you know. I'd like and you then to meet I'll my say, first okay. wife. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I've had guys say that. They're like, are you talking about my first wife or my second <laughs> wife or my current, you know? Anyway, and then my next question is, how many of you have a plan mm. to achieve that? Mm. Do you have a plan? Because in your career as a first responder, I know you have a plan. Yeah. You know, when you decide, hey, I want to be a first responder and it's like, OK, I need I, I got to go take a test. I got to talk to a firefighter. I got to talk to a police officer. I got to talk to someone to figure out what do I need to do to make this happen. Right. And so there's a plan there. And then it's OK, I got to take a test and then I got to take a physical and then I got to take a mental evaluation. OK, great. There's a plan there. and oh, by the way, you're, here's a chief's interview and now you get hired and we're going to ship you off to rookie school, mm -hmm. right? You're going to go through an academy and we're going to train you on what it is to be a police officer, a firefighter, a correctional officer, an EMS person, whatever it is, you're going to get trained in that. 
And so there's a plan. There's a plan. There's a plan. There's a plan every step of the way. And then once you get in, you're a rookie for a year and you're looking at everything and you're looking at the people that you're working with and you're like, hey, you know, I kind of like this EMS thing. Maybe I'll go be a paramedic, you know, or hey, maybe I'll be a truckie or maybe I'll move up into being a rank of a lieutenant someday or something. You know, I mean, there's a plan. There's always a plan. And so when you have that plan, the great thing about the uh, first responder world is there's all these tools available to help you achieve that goal and to live out that plan, which is great. I mean, it's awesome. You're being trained on how to be successful. The problem is, is how many of us, even whether you're a first responder or not, how many of us have had any type of training that helps us with our relationships? None. None. It doesn't it, exist. We, we, we just don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't exist. We're not teaching it in the schools. We're not teaching it. You know, I mean, it's just it's not there. And it's vital. It's so vital because most of us, I mean, you guys know this, that most of us come from this world of trauma and of just the different things that we've dealt with as kids, right? Mm -hmm. We watched our parents, how they communicated or oh, didn't, didn't communicate, communicate yeah. with exactly. And, and it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be in a relationship like that. Right. And then your spouse, on the other hand, they may have came from a toxic environment as well. And now you're bringing these two people that have these examples of 18, 20, 30 years of poor examples of what a relationship looks like. And now you're going to put them together and you're going to say, we wish you yeah. luck. Do your best. Live happily ever happily after. Ever after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, like once exactly. you get to the happily ever after part of the story, that's the end of the story. But the reality yeah. is, is that's just the beginning. But all of our cultural focus on relationships is how to get in one and how to find the person to get into one. But there's no discussion about how do you stay there in a healthy, happy way. Yeah. And normalizing and, the yeah. idea, too, that it's part of the growth in a marriage and in a relationship is the miscommunication, is the disagreements and the arguments. And so I grew up in a family where my folks never argued. And so when they said, hey, we're getting a divorce, I was like, what? But that was part of the problem is they were so disconnected from their marriage that there was nothing to argue about. They were living separate lives in the same home. And so there's that side of things, too, is disagreements aren't bad, but it's learning how to communicate through the disagreements that is going to make the relationship grow and thrive and be effective. Absolutely. You know, I, in my household, when I grew up, my dad said what he said, and that was it. There was never an argument. There was never a disagreement because if there was, you would be laying on the floor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so there was no disagreement. You just went along. Dad said this, okay, we're going to do that. And yeah. that's the end of it. And so when I came into my relationship with my bride of 29 years, just this last week, 29 oh, years, you congratulations. guys. And I love that you still call her your bride. Oh, your bride. Oh, she is. She's my bride. And I, I'm so lucky that she married me. And I'm so lucky that she has stayed married to me. We've been through so much together. I've put her through so much pain and suffering. Honestly, I can't believe she's still with me through all of this. I can. Um, I can too. I can. So. And, and here's why. Because this is who you are. Everything else was layers of issues that just needed to be removed, addressed, but your bride is the one person who has never lost focus of who you actually are, mm -hmm. probably even when you yeah. did. So she knows who she married and who was underneath all the pain and the suffering and mm -hmm. the symptoms and the decision-making, like she knew who you were mm -hmm. and you are a okay, guy. You're not going to make me cry, are you? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what we I do. Mean, I'm, sure. I mean, I have made a few men cry in my life. <laughs> not going to lie. Definitely. But that's not my goal. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, she's wonderful. And she totally supports everything that I have gone through and been through and 
the hurt in the department and the different things that have happened to me in my career and then the aftermath and, and everything. But you, you were asking me, we're kind of getting off the track a little bit. You, you asked me about how did I get into this, right? How did I start in the fire service and stuff? Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of a, a fairy tale story, if you will, because um, I have dyslexia pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And so I listen to books and I, I do all that kind of stuff. And I was diagnosed with learning disabilities when I was a kid. I was hyperactive. I was sometimes out of control. It was really a bad scene. And there's a lot of things that I have just kind of blocked out of my memory about my childhood. But the one thing that I remember that was a, a really great thing about my childhood was that I was at school one day. And it was in California. I was, I was born in uh, Huntington Park, California, and I was at uh, school and the firefighters showed up and our playground area was all asphalt. It had, you know, monkey bars with pads on it and all that kind of stuff, but it was all asphalt and the whole school was outside. And we were getting to watch these firefighters go through all these different drills and put their bunker gear on and they were climbing ladders and they were squirting water and they were taking the hydrants and they were doing all this really cool stuff and picking people up on stretchers and moving around. And it was all going on at one time. And they were in uniform and, you know, guys were yelling and, you know, yes, sir, and no, sir, and all this just going around doing all this kind of stuff. Their rigs were red. They were beautiful. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> Who are these guys? Where are they? You know, and it was just like, that was my first look. And then after the, the show that they did, they came into our classroom and I can't tell you a thing I learned when I was a kid, but I can remember exactly what that firefighter said and what he did. He walked into the room he had his uniform on, he had a badge on, he had his uh, radio on, and, and he was just dressed in this gorgeous uniform and patches and everything. And my eyes were just glued on this guy. Probably had a mustache, you know, <laughs> I don't know, you know. And he just talked about how he remembered being in a classroom like this when he was a kid and a firefighter came in and da 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 da, da And I'm just like going... I'm in. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do, how this is going to work. But we moved out of East LA. My dad lost his job and uh, we moved to Toppenish, Washington, which is in the Yakima Valley. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's the fruit bowl of the state. It's actually on the Yakima Indian Nation Reservation. Wow. It's a city of Toppenish. And we have a big rodeo there. And I mean, it's a real cowboy town, you know. And so you've got the Cowboys, the Indians, and the guys that are playing sports and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just this kind of place. And so my dad was a reserve police officer. My uncle was a police officer. My neighbor was a police officer. My best friend's mom was a police officer. So I kind of grew up at that age with all police officers. And, and I just figured, ah, I'm going to grow up and be a police yeah. officer. And uh, I didn't have a real good relationship with my dad. And I ran away from home a few times, especially when we moved to Toppenish, because I was just out of my whole element and lost all my friends and all that kind of stuff. So my neighbor, another neighbor, was a firefighter. And he reached out and he said, hey, Tim, I want you to come down to the firehouse. And I was like 13 years old. And so I rode my bike down there and he was at work. And it's a small little town. And so there was only one firefighter and it was him. But if there was a call, then the volunteers would come and they would meet at the call and they had a green light that was go in their car and that let everyone know that they need to allow the firefighter to get by to go to the call because they're going to go help somebody. And so I would go down there and just hang out at the fire station. He'd show me the rigs and he'd say, hey, we need to roll some hose or we need to clean the bathrooms or we need to, you know, vacuum upstairs or, you know, whatever. And he just had me be a part of it and be there with him. Wow. And his name was Ron Cobb. He's in firefighter heaven right now, but he just took me under his wing. And some of the other guys that he worked with and the volunteers, they were all like, Hey, Tim, how you doing? You know, come on. We're going to do fill the boot this next weekend. Why don't you come and help us? And just all these things. And so the day I turned 16, they called me and said, Hey, we need you to come down to the fire station. And so I went down to the fire station and there was a set 
of bunkers mm. and a contract right there. And they said, we want you to be a part of our team. We want you uh. to be a volunteer firefighter. I, I, that was it. I was in, Yeah. you know, all the things that happened with my dad and my uncle and, and all the different things that I, I was just like, oh my gosh, these guys want me here. And so I'm going to do this. And so I became a volunteer. And back then you had to have your uh, advanced first aid. And, and in that department, EMS wasn't there. They would go to calls and tear up the car to get people out and all that kind of stuff. But that's when people weren't wearing seatbelts. You know, I mean, so yeah. the accidents were, you know, and the, and the cars were made out of metal. And so the accidents mm -hmm. were just brutal and people were just, you know, destroyed. And uh, so anyway, I'm 16 years old. I started as a volunteer. I'm doing this kind of stuff. Well, the mortuary was right down the street from the fire station. And that's where the aid car was. And they did the EMS. And so since I was a young guy, the firefighters really didn't want to get into doing first aid. They didn't want to be EMTs. And so some of them, though, would volunteer over at the mortuary. And so they called me and said, hey, we know that you have your first aid and you just got your advanced first aid. Would you like to work with us? So I went to work at the mortuary also. So whether it was a fire call or it was an EMS call, I had a pager. I was going. And I was 16. I mean, I just got my driver's license. I was just, you know, the whole thing. It was crazy. It was Barely crazy. have a fully but developed brain. Like you still got like years, nine years to go before everything is where it's supposed to be. And so that is really, uh, there's so many pros to helping you find your way and shape your trajectory and give you an outlet for that angst and help you find your purpose. And also, that is a really young age to be exposed to the atrocities that you're going to see. So I saw some amazing, horrifying things at the age of 16. I can share a story with you if you want it. Please. I mean, so one of the biggest things that I remember is we were on a call. There was a, uh, a car accident. I got a page like three o'clock in the morning. And it was some teenagers that had been drinking and driving. They lost control of their car. It slid on its side. They got decapitated. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible thing. So we get that all taken care of and the troopers are there and everybody's, you know, doing all their stuff and everything. We get back to the station and there was a couple of kids that kind of made it. And so we were able to get them to the hospital and stuff. And anyway, um, we get back to the station and we're cleaning the rigs. We're doing all the stuff. And the sun is just now coming up. I mean, it's just barely coming up. And the bay doors were open and the station wagon pulls up. And we're thinking they need directions, whatever. And so I run out there and the guys that I'm working with are older guys. They're like in their 30s, right? And so I run out there and, hey, can I help you? And this lady gets out of her car and she's holding a blanket. And she walks over. And she hands me the blanket and it had some weight to it. And it's just like, this is like split second stuff, right? This is split second stuff. And so I go like that. And as soon as I accepted the blanket from her, she didn't say anything. She was either uh, Native American or Mexican. I mean, I just, I'm not sure we didn't really converse. Mm -hmm. And she looked very sad. She hand me the blanket. I took the blanket. She jumps back in the car. The car takes off and I'm like, what's going on? And so I kind of hold the blanket and I lift it up to look and it's a dead baby. <sighs> and I, I mean, I'm 16. I, I, I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, I'm in shock because I'm like, this is, it didn't look real yeah. to be honest with you. It just didn't look real. And so I turned around and the guys are like, you know, teasing me about, oh, did you give them wrong directions? Or, you know, they give you a blanket, you know, but, you know, just guys ribbing you a little bit. Yeah. And I walk in and one of the older guys walks over. He notices my face and he looks and he's like, what is it? And he opens it up. He immediately turned around and vomited. I mean, just like he, it was like instant, like, boom, that was it. Oh my gosh. And I'm still holding this blanket. The other guy's like, what's going on? And I can't even speak. Then the mortician comes out and he knew, what, you know, and he took, I mean, it was, it was a thing, right? I mean, it was just, it was crazy. It was so, so crazy. And I've seen 
other um, miscarriages and SIDS deaths and, and that sort of thing. But that one just does not leave your brain. And at 16, yep. how do you process that, right? And we didn't talk about it. I didn't go home and tell my mom and dad. And so my analogy now, you guys, is I tell the story of I have this knapsack on my back. I have this rucksack mm -hmm. and I just stuffed it. I just put it in there. I just forgot about it. And all these different calls that I went on and all the things that I was able to do at 16 years old, 17 years old for the past 44 years, I would just put it away. I would stuff it away mm -hmm. in that rucksack. And it just kept happening over and over every time. It just kind of kept happening. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So from there, I went to community college and I was a volunteer there. And then from community college in the Columbia Basin, Tri-Cities area. And then from there, I went to WSU, go Cougs. <laughs> and I was right in the fire station, right at WSU, right on campus. And that was an amazing experience. That fire station was there for a hundred years and then they shut it down. Mm. And then the city of Pullman took over the volunteer program that way. So then from there, I graduated from college. Remember, I've got this learning disability, right? So it's not easy for me to get through school. So it actually took me six years to get a degree. But you didn't quit. You didn't let it take you I did, out. I did, I, I'm not a quitter. Really? I, <laughs> I'm really, really not a quitter. Um, I lived out of my car for a while. And I worked a lot of different jobs and finally got hired with the city of Kirkland. After I got hired with the city of Kirkland, I was there for about a year. And it was an amazing opportunity to be hired with that department. And the, one of the reasons I got hired was because my physical ability, you said, you know, I'm kind of a big guy. I was able to physically do well on their physical test. And back then it was, you got points that went towards your total score. Mm. So my written score wasn't great, but my physical score, I did real well with that. And so they combined them and that's how I got hired. And so it was a real blessing because I took like 18 different tests before I got hired. And it was just because of my dyslexia, dyslexia and not being able to do well on tests mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And so can uh, I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah. So keeping in mind, like, can you just those of us who are terrible at math, about what year was this? Which when I got hired? When, yeah. When you were getting hired, when you were going through school, like the 70s, 80s, what oh, era oh, yeah. are we talking? I started in the fire service at 16 and it was in the 70s. We were riding tailboard and we didn't have SCBAs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh Lord. And everything was canvas. The reason I ask is because I think a lot of our listeners who are younger may not necessarily realize the advantages that they may or their peers may have today in our education oh. system when it comes to support, resources, advocacy, intervention. But I'm going to guess that you were pretty much winging this on your own. Yeah. You were trying to navigate all of this, the dyslexia, how to take a test, how to manage the way that your brain works so you could actually display your knowledge in a standardized format that did not work with your brain and you were on your own. On Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't until after I was diagnosed with learning disabilities, you know, ADHD. I mean, I, you name it, all the acronyms. I didn't know what any of that stuff meant, but as I was getting older, I was getting diagnosed with more things, if you will. Like almost um, like a more was, like specificity. Yes. Yeah. It when, wasn't when just I was, the learning disability. Yeah. When I went to WSU, I started with criminal justice there at Columbia Basin Community College. And it was more hands-on. It was like, hey, these are handcuffs. This is how you frisk someone. This is how you use a baton. This is, you know, all the different things you do as a police officer. And then I went to WSU and they said, well, what major do you want to major in? Because I got in the fire department first. And I said, well, I, I started with criminal justice. And they go, oh, we have a criminal justice degree here at WSU. We'll put you in that. So my first day of class, I kid you not, was a pre-law class and the book was this thick. And they said, you need to read this much of that book by the next class <sighs> and we're going to give a dissertation. You know, I mean, it was just this crazy thing. And I'm like going, 
I'm screwed. Yeah. I'm done. I guess I'm going home because you know, and then they put me through some tests and all this stuff. And they're like, okay, you've got learning disabilities and, you know, da, 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 and all this kind of stuff. So it was really hard. It was really hard. And so they actually looked at my scores, looked at my personality and all that kind of stuff. And they said, you know, we think you should go into recreation. And so I got my degree in recreation. I went from criminal justice to recreation. And it's funny because I used to be a lifeguard and I did swim lessons and all that kind of stuff. And degree of recreation Mm -hmm. was more hands on. You got to teach classes and you did things and and you worked with, I got to work with Special Olympic kids and all these different really, really cool things. And I was able to get my degree. And that was my goal was to get a degree. So it was really tough. And there was a way. Like, There was an adaption. Of course, it wasn't what you originally went in there with, but it would be easy to be like, forget it. Obviously, I'm not going to get to do what I want to do. There is a version where you could have played like victim to the circumstance. You're like, well, I guess I'm going to adapt. And Mm -hmm. in turn, being in the fire service, having this recreation background, which is it's a recreational activity, if you will, a career. Climbing Um, ladders. Yeah. I imagine (laughs) that kind of served you later on. (laughs) Well, I became the social director at our fire station at WSU. And so I set up all the dances and parties and everything with the sororities. And because we were the Phi R house, you know. That's so, so funny. Was, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of good times. And then when I finally did get hired with the Kirkland uh, Fire Department, they took advantage of it as well. Being able to have me put on different events. And, you were like Julie on the love boat. You were the social director. <laughs> yeah. Looks yeah, <laughs> just yeah, like her too. Yeah. <laughs> kind of that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of kind of like it was a, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But WSU was a very interesting fire department as well cuz we were all college students and we had a fire chief that came in and he said, "Look, he goes, if you screw up, no one's ever going to forget it." Mm. Because you're students. And so you have to be an example out on campus as well as here in the station and on calls. And so we really took it seriously and we disciplined each other and we kept each other in line. We had some interesting ways of taking care of people that got out of line. Would you draw any (laughs) parallels between perhaps not the Phi R house, but other houses that may have Greek letters in terms of that self-moderating, self-modulating, like behavior modification, like don't do that, do this, because this is what it looks like and what will happen if that continues. Right. And, you know, back then we're talking in the 80s, right? We're in the 80s now. And back then, fraternities and sororities were just mm-hmm. kind of crazy places. I mean, they just, they Animal just House. were. Animal House. Yeah, that was kind of that time frame. And WSU was kind of known for being kind of the party school and, and that sort of thing. So it was, again, a lot of very unique situations that you would see at a young age if you're working in the fire department. We became EMTs there, emergency medical technicians there at WSU. And some of the calls we saw were just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy, you know, because WSU is out in the middle of the Palouse. And so it's a real farming community, a lot of wheat farmers and, and stuff like that. And so when the town of Pullman or some of the county areas were overwhelmed, they would call WSU firefighters to come in and help them out. And so whether it was a wheat fire or grass fire, or if it was a big accident or or whatever, or they're on calls because there a lot of them were volunteers back then as well, we would go and help each other. And so you saw some agricultural accidents and those are pretty brutal. Brutal. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. When a farmer calls 911, it's it's a bad scene. It's a bad scene, you guys. Yeah, because uh, yeah. they don't call. No, they they, <laughs> they tourniqueted they'll, they'll themselves. They'll just take duct. Yeah, yeah, they'll put on duct tape and yeah. they'll you know do whatever they need to do. And I actually yeah, grew so. I grew up in a farming community and was in 4-H and took animals and 
even now the fields by my parents' house is rented out to people who plant and and harvest and usually it's hay and, and soybeans in Ohio, but it is like pulling teeth to get those folks to call or even get any kind of medical assistance. So if you're getting that 911 call, you know it's serious beyond uh mm-hmm. beyond serious. Yeah. Like you're looking yeah. at amputations yeah. and and things already being having been yeah. cut off and yeah. It's yeah. a rough rough life. So there was there was this call I'll never forget and it was a CPR call and it came in right when the sun was coming up and Toppenish is this community on the reservation but then there's another community it's called White Swan and it's probably 35 40 miles from there that's really like reservation getting close to the reservation that if you're not native american you can't go on right i mean it's that close and so this call came in for a trooper that called in that needed assistance we didn't really know what we were going to but we went there and it took us probably 15 to 20 minutes to get there literally just to get to the call and that's We're the aid car from the mortuary and we get the call. I got my pager. I get out of bed. I put my clothes on. I jump in the car. I drive to the place, get the aid car. And now we're driving to the, so it took a while before we got there, Mm -hmm. right? This trooper is out in this farm and we knew we were out in the middle of nowhere, but it's on this farm. And this, this trooper is doing CPR on a guy that's laying out in the dry, not driveway, but like dirt Mm -hmm. area in front of the farmhouse. And we get there and it's like a bloody mess. And this guy's head is just destroyed. And the trooper's eyes were like Mm -hmm. this big, you know, he's trying to save this guy's life. And we're like, what happened? And so we take over and we start doing CPR. We throw him on the gurney. And back then it was scoop and go. We Mm -hmm. weren't medics. So we scooped him up and we had to do CPR all the way back to, so 20 minutes back into town to the hospital in Toppenish. And we're doing CPR in the back of the rig on this guy. It's just a, just a mess. It's just an absolute horror mess. And we get there and the doctor comes out to the rig and he's like, he's dead. Yeah. You know, that's how we could stop is because the, the they would come out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we're like, okay, what happened? And the trooper got there and he was covered in blood. And I mean, this guy, it was, this was just, a, it was a train wreck. It's like a right? scene from a movie. And it was, mm-hmm. it was so weird. So here's what happened though. This farmer goes out to do his fields right before the sun comes up. And he goes out, well, he forgets his lunch. So he comes back home and finds this guy that's outside, his head's all bashed in, trying to attack his wife. And so he goes out to his truck and he gets a shovel and he beats the guy to death with a shovel. And he dropped out there. And when the trooper got there, he had him in the car, Mm -hmm. right? And he's working on this guy. And I'm just like, is this real? Right? I'm just like, is this real? It was was insane. I mean, it was stuff like that that we saw. Those stories that everybody's got one, but like there's always going to be that unique one where... Maybe it's at the same level as another uh, crazy like story. Horrendous stories, but but how many people can say that they responded to a call when a guy stopped an assault on his wife simply by forgetting his lunch, mm. and then that's what it rolled into, right? Yeah. And I think that yeah. kind of brings to the forefront part of the opportunity that you have when there's not that information at the beginning of the story is Mm -hmm. that it eliminates judgment. Like you're just there to do what you can to preserve life. And what we're trained to do. Yeah. And so not knowing those details yet, there's no worry that somebody is going to be like, "Eh, he was a bad guy. Yeah. Or if this guy did this to my wife, you know, like that's not present. Right. 
And I think today, a lot of times, especially around addiction and medic response, there is that judgment that comes up about, I like to call it Narcan fatigue. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. About like, now we're inserting our opinions, our judgments, our own compassion fatigue into that scene. And I think it's a luxury to not know. Yeah. In a lot of, a lot of those situations. You know, I think for first responders, man, you know, I've seen such a change. When I got in, there was no such thing as wellness. There was no such thing as peer support. There was no such thing as even what you guys do, right? I mean, there's no psychiatrists. There was no counselors. There was no, there was nothing like that. No one ever talked about any of, no EAP, nothing. There was, there was nothing like that available for us. But yet we would see guys go down alcohol. We'd see guys go down uh, gambling. We'd see guys go to these different Mm -hmm. infidelity. Absolutely. Big time. Right. And it's so common in the first responder world to be divorced at least once, at least once, if not twice. Right. And it's just a common, it's a common thing. And I believe we're going back to relationships, but uh, I believe that's it because we just don't know how to be successful in our relationships. There's a statistic, and I don't know if this is true or not. Maybe you guys know this, but I heard someone say that 80% of us as first responders have had some type of trauma under the age of 12 that was either physical abuse or mental abuse or sexual mm-hmm. abuse. And 80% of us, I mean, is that true? Do you guys know if that's true? I have the answer. Is that I have r- the answer. Is that true? So is that really so here, true? I'm going I'm to give you She's three statistics. This. Like this is my jam. This is my jam, Tim. So 60. Oh, you got to meet my bride, though. <laughs> she wants to, she's, she's going to want to talk to you. I, I, I could talk about childhood trauma and post traumatic stress all day. Mm-hmm. Um, so 61% of uh, American adults have experienced an adverse childhood experience. According to statistical reports, 86% of firefighters have experienced an adverse childhood experience Mm -hmm. and 60, I'm sorry, that is, I think that's 87 and 68%. So 7% increase from the average American is police. But here's the difference between why police is only 68% and fire is in the eighties is because fire has less to lose by being honest. Mm Mm-hmm. So we can take it with a grain of salt when we have numbers and statistics around mental health and wellness when it comes to law enforcement, simply because they're gambling with their weapon and their status as a peace officer. Like sure. that is that makes sense. So yes, uh, when it comes to the fire service, we're looking at more than a 20% jump. Wow. And The very first time I went to a first RC conference, there was a gentleman there and you may know who he is. His name is Mike Jackson and he's a a Seattle firefighter and a retired Mm -hmm. Marine. Uh, He had me at hello. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I tell my clients this all the time, like I even said it probably three times yesterday, first responders and those in the criminal index are two branches on the same tree Mm -hmm. because, and, and I even added on, I'm like, and then the moss of addiction is on both branches. But the reality is that there's a lot of first responders who didn't have a need met and decided that they would be that need. Yep. They would be the person Mm -hmm. that was there for someone else. Yeah. And the criminality trajectory is I didn't have that person. And so screw you all. Mm. So is that a subconscious thing that we have, you think? Because I didn't think about that when I was going into being a first responder, you know, a firefighter. I didn't have that mindset at 16. I just loved the job. I just loved helping people. Well, that's well it, and think too. about that passion, uh-huh. right? Like what passion had you experienced to that degree prior to that? What experience of a sense of belonging and a sense of being wanted and having a purpose, like as you're running off the res 
And all of a sudden, now you're having this experience where they're giving you cake, giving you uniforms, they're they're giving you their time and their attention. And you're a valuable resource as well. So you're getting the accolades, you're getting the yeah. support. And the way you described this mm. gentleman, he must have seen something in you to be like, this young man needs a mentor and I'm going to scoop him up and give him that because otherwise mm-hmm. you could have been on the criminal side that Cinnamon just spoke into. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have mm-hmm. to wonder what was his journey like? That he saw a troubled Mm -hmm. teenage boy who he decided, I'm going to intervene and unbeknownst to him, change the trajectory of your Mm -hmm. life. So, so do I think that it's subconscious? I, I, I don't know if that is the exact word, but when you think about our human need to belong, not to just fit in, but to belong and feel purposeful and to feel embraced and to be wanted when there is childhood abuse, neglect, all of those things. Like we are craving someone to say that they want us. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's, that's important. I think it's interesting because I worked in four different departments, right? And if you count the, the mortuary, you could say five, I guess, mm-hmm. but no one ever talked about this stuff. Yeah. Ever. It never was brought up ever. And I saw guys in my department where I was for 30 years. I was in the city of Kirkland when I got hired. And there, I saw guys having issues and problems, but nobody ever talked about it. And they didn't talk about it. And all of a sudden, it would be like, okay, now this guy's retiring mm-hmm. or this person is leaving or, you know, whatever. And it's just like, why? What? What's going on? This is the best job in the world. You know, why would anybody ever leave it? And Never once did I think that I was going to have any kind of issue or struggle or problem or anything ever. Mm. I loved going to work. I loved my job. I loved the people I worked with. I loved, you know, working for the citizens of Kirkland and being there for them on Lake Washington and in the city. It was the best. I absolutely loved it. Um, But But I I, imagine it was until it wasn't. That rucksack. Until it wasn't. Right. It starts overflowing is the thing. Right. You can shove it down right. there. You can get the zipper right. zipped up or whatever the buckle on, but eventually there's yeah. no more room in your rucksack and yeah. it all starts yeah. spilling out. Spilling mm-hmm. out like hot lava so, on other people. Yeah. I'm going to change gears here just a second because I want to bring my bride into this picture because I was this firefighter, right? And I, um, I loved my job and, you know, I dated and I, that kind of thing. And I had plenty of opportunities to, you know, pursue someone if I wanted to. And I just said, no, I am not doing this until I get hired as a firefighter because this is what I want to do. And I don't want anything to get in my way. And so after I got hired with the department is when I met my bride. And one of the reasons I married her was because I could see that she was strong. Mm. She was drop dead gorgeous. I mean, come on, you guys. I mean, (laughs) so my wife is 6'2". I'm about 6'6". I used to be 6'7". I've shrunk a little bit. It's kind of jumping off the fire rig with a backpack on. I'll do that to you. But yeah, kind of crunches things down. So when I played some ball in college, I was 6'8". So I really kind of crunched down over time. But my bride is 6'2". And she played volleyball at the University of Oregon. Go Ducks. She's a a duck. (laughs) And yeah, right there in Eugene. And so she was beautiful, but she was also strong. You know, she was mentally strong. She was not just, I'm not talking physically strong because she was, I mean, she, it was mentally, she was strong. And I'm like, that's what I need to have in a wife. Cause I've seen guys that have been married to women that weren't strong Mm -hmm. and they had problems, right? And so I'm looking, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I'm looking and I'm like, well, that looks like a decent relationship. That one, definitely not. That one, maybe, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's like, maybe I can get this. And I wanted whoever I was going to marry to look at what I was doing as a firefighter and say, yes, this is good. I can go along mm-hmm. with this. You know, I knew I'd never be rich. I didn't become a firefighter to be rich. I became a firefighter because I wanted to help people. Yeah. And I love the job of being able to come to work and you had no idea what you were going to do. You know, you might be cutting someone out of a car. You might be going to a house fire. You might be doing, you know, whatever. You might be doing a tour for kids that are coming in to someday want to be firefighters. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's just all the different things. And so I just love that about the job. And you never knew what you were going to be going on. 
but I wanted someone that would come along with me and want to be a part of that. And when uh, Lori came into my life, that's a whole story in itself. But when we got together, it was like, well, how do we make this work? How do we do this? And we got pregnant right away. And our son drew, um, we're, I, I think I've told you we're the tall family. Our son yes, drew, yes. he's, he's 28 years old now and he is six eleven, and, um, Crazy. I don't even yeah. know how to like imagine that. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. yeah he, that's like two feet taller than me. 6'11 would be two yeah, feet taller yeah. than me. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. And he's such a great guy. <laughs> he's single. He's single. So if you have anybody, if you have anybody over six foot out there, <laughs> he's the man. We need our tall yeah. ladies to uh, go ahead yeah. and submit photos and bios <laughs> too. Yeah, exactly. And that, and you know, that, that was the thing when Lori met me. It was that I was tall and, and I was a nice guy and I was a firefighter and I had a job and I had a car and I, you know, all those things. Right. And being a six, two female is like, she, she probably found you very attractive because not only are you all those other things, but you're also taller than her. Right. Exactly. And that was the, that was the one box that was probably very difficult to check. Yeah. What I just wanted to say, just rewind a smidge, is something you said was I wanted a bride who could get behind what I did, like get behind the fire service. But what's interesting Mm -hmm. is as someone who is not part of it, we only get so much. It's like, for me, it's like I think about the firefighters and the calendar and like, ooh, the big heroes, but they don't understand what they're actually getting behind, just like you guys don't necessarily understand what you're signing up for and getting behind when you come into this. It's like, you only know so much. And it's like, yes, I will date the firefighter with his uniform because, well, it's hot, you know, and I can get behind him being a kind, loving helper. But other than that, it's like, oh, shit, there is all this other stuff that I signed up for that I didn't know I signed up for. And just like the first responder can't be prepared to know what they were getting into, the spouses can't be prepared to know exactly what they're getting into. And so to have that strong woman by your side, that's like, all right, I didn't know. And now I know, and we're going to do it versus a spouse. That's like, uh, this is not what I signed up for. And I'm out of here. I'm not going to adapt with you. I'm not going to be by your side, quote unquote, till death do us part, no matter what in sickness and in health, because this isn't what I thought. I just thought I was getting a calendar boy and I'm getting the rucksack too. (laughs) <laughs> since that's yep, how you exactly the thing that i find interesting especially now when you're seeing a lot of the auxiliaries just not exist anymore is that kind of like how you were talking tim at the beginning about this plan right you've got these mentors you've got people to call you've you've got people who are responsible for training you on how to be a firefighter And we do not have necessarily people training these spouses on how to be a first responder spouse. Mm -hmm. And they are depending on you to tell them what to do. And you don't have any idea. And you at least have somebody who can tell you how to be a firefighter, but she's not going to firefighter wife school every day. (laughs) She's not, you know, there's no station for her. So she's sitting a lot of times in isolation and maybe it was more active back then with the auxiliary, but it's like, she's probably even more at a loss than you are when -hmm. it comes to what do I tolerate? What is acceptable? Like, you know, it's his day off and he's doing this and he's not been here for 24 hours. I may be getting aggravated, but what is appropriate to get aggravated about? What's appropriate to accept? What is reasonable? Like there's no measuring stack. Well, you know, it's so funny that you mentioned that because my bride and I were talking about this just the other day. We looked at this program with stronger families that we were like, where was this 30 years ago? Mm -hmm. Where was this when we first got married? Because we struggled. We really, really struggled because that newness wears Mm -hmm. off. And now I'm coming home and Lori says to me, hey, how was your shift? Well, what do we say? It was fine. It was good. It was good. You know, and I didn't tell her about 
the baby call or the fire that somebody got hurt in or the car that we had to cut someone out or someone that drowned or, you know, whatever. I I didn't go into those stories with Mm -hmm. her. Why don't I do that? Because I want to protect her. Yeah. She's my family. I want to protect her. And then we have kids. I don't want to tell these stories with kids, but now that I have kids, it's like, wait a minute. I've been on so many kid calls. My kid is never, never, ever, ever going to be in a bathtub alone, ever, period. Will not happen, right? And it comes across that way too. It's like, now I'm telling my child's mom, lecturing her on, you will never leave your kid in the tub for a second, right? And she's like, wait a minute, who are you to tell me to be a mom? You know, <laughs> you know, it just, it goes into this thing, right? Yeah. And it's because of the calls we've been on and the things that we've seen that it's like, no, that's not going to happen. No, you're not going to run with scissors. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're developing this rigidness out of mm-hmm. experience, mm-hmm. but nobody is getting to know what that experience exactly. is. So it just sounds like you're an overbearing dad yep. who leaves for 24 hours and still wants to be the boss yep. of everybody. Yeah, comes back and controls yep. the you're environment. Not get, you're, you're 16 years old or you're 15 years old and you are not getting into that car. I don't mm-hmm. care. Yeah. I say that all the time. I'm like, God bless the 16-year-old daughter <laughs> of a first responder because she ain't right. getting in a car. She's not driving. Right. She's not a passenger. <laughs> Everybody's going to be renting a limo for prom because no prom night is horrible. It doesn't happen to every kid, but it's going to happen to somebody's kid. You're not going to let it happen to your kid. All of those things that end up being family interpersonal battles like, oh, honey, just she's a good kid. She's safe. She makes good. You're like, I don't care because it's not about all the decisions that she makes. You Mm -hmm. know, and it's that gap of like, I don't have a point of reference of why Mm -hmm. you are so adamant and so rigid. And now to the point of hostility, Mm -hmm. insisting that this is how we parent. But I don't know what you've seen. And even if you said, well, you know, this is a really Mm -hmm. bad night for car accidents. That still doesn't Mm -hmm. convey. And I like to say most people play the odds. First responders play the tragedy. So is it likely? No. But let me just tell you, when it does happen on that odd chance, you are going to regret letting her get in that car. You're going to regret going and answering that phone and leaving that baby in that bathtub. Like you already have these images. And because that's what you do all the time, it's frequent, right? Like Mm -hmm. we might hear about a teenager over the course of our lives who gets into a car accident and it's tragic. But you're the one who responds to every single one of those calls. Mm. I mean, oh, I, yeah. when you go on that call, you just want to grab that kid and just hug him and just tell him, you know, I mean, it's the worst. It's the worst call. Mm. It's horrible. The, the fear that they have in their face and on their being and the energy, it's horrifying. And so I knew where my daughter was freaking all the time, you know, on the phone, sure. you know, the whole deal. I mean, it was just, it was like, Oh man, it can drive you nuts. So how you find, and I say how you find, because I am cautious to say, how do you find? Cause that's posing the question and I don't know if anybody has the answer, but how do you find that balance between not exposing your children in particular, family in general to, you know, I had somebody tell me it's bad enough that I know mm-hmm. what I saw. Mm-hmm. I don't need mm-hmm. anybody else to know what I saw, Right, but, and to protect them from what is actually out there while also making it clear to them that without this information, I still need you to trust me mm-hmm. that I'm protecting you and not just being an overbearing, controlling buzzkill of a parent. I think right? I don't want way, you to know this. Mm-hmm. I think the only way you can do it as a first responder is you have to, you have to listen. Mm. When your kids are talking to you, you have to listen. And then they have an opportunity to listen to you and say, look, son, the reason I'm saying this is because I've seen this. I wouldn't want this ever to happen to you. And I don't think it ever will. But I was trained in the think, plan, act. Mm. You think about it, 
you plan for it and then you act on it. Right. And I want you to just have a mindset of that. And both my kids, I have two adults. My son is uh, 28 years old and my daughter is 26 now. And she just got married just a couple of weeks ago. Aww, and uh, yeah, yeah. And Ryan is, is our son-in-law and we love him. He's just such a great guy. He's been so good to our daughter. We just, they came and lived with us during the pandemic. Um, I'm like, yes. She's like, Hey, uh, you know, can my boy Brandon kind of, and I'm like, yes, you come live with us. Cause I want to check this guy out. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> going to make or break a kid. Right. Like, right. right. If you can exactly. hack it for being in isolation, yep. then you're in. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, but now the question um, is how, how tall is your daughter and how tall is Ryan? So Grace is the, uh, she's the short one of the family. She's six foot tall. <laughs> okay. Yeah. She's the runt. And we always had a joke. We always had a joke in our family that, um, well, maybe it wasn't really a joke, but yeah, it's a joke. A joke. We were kind of is serious. It, <laughs> it's kind of serious, but, uh, you can't bring someone home under six foot tall. <laughs> for I mean, both it's going right? to mess up the family photo. Right. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> that, and that's what really counts, right? I mean, that, that's what my bride would say. So, uh, and Ryan is right at six. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's right there. But what we tell people is we just love him. He is so good to our daughter. You know, my prayer has always been for my kids that they would find someone that loves them more then I love their mom. Mm. Oh. Which is clearly right? I mean, a that, lot. I was going to say yeah. that is a hard, hard measuring stick. Uh-huh. We can tell. And uh, my son-in-law is just, he's a wonderful guy. And uh, he treats our daughter treats her like a princess. And he's so good to her. And I love being around them and seeing the love that they have for each other. Mm-hmm. And Lori and I are able to share the tools that we're learning with stronger families and different things like that to pass on to our kids and stuff. So which is awesome. Really really cool. Because I was thinking like, because you have gone through your fair share of clearly traumatic circumstances and come out on the other side and become one, went through some kind of treatment process, which I'm sure you'll tell us about, but also become an advocate. And you're able to explain now to your adult children, like, okay, does this make sense now? And so it mm-hmm. gives them also the upper hand when their children come along to be open and forthright because they mm. learned what it was like not get both sides of the story as children, yeah, which just yeah. that communication between parents and children is so important. Being able to at times be yeah. peers, if you will, to explain, hey, the reason I'm acting like this is because of this, because we have to show our kids that we're human beings, too. You know, otherwise, how do they learn how to adapt and handle emotions and handle hard things? Yeah. And it wasn't easy on my kids being a first responder daughter or son. And they would be more than, you know, my son is like, hey, I'll tell that story. (laughs) You know, know, I'll tell that story. Uh, But um, Lori and I struggled with our marriage after a while. And it got pretty bad. And we did go to counseling. I had a good captain at the time that he said, hey, if you really love her and you really want to keep this going, you probably should go get some counseling. And so we went to the counselor and counselor gave us some books and we did some things. And then my wife is a real study, right? She goes out and she finds information and she reads more books and all that kind of stuff. And So she would read these books and because of my dyslexia, she would write things out for me and I would be able to look at them at work. And so I'd take them to work in these little notebooks that she would kind of make for me, cliff notes, if you will. And guys are at work like, hey, what are you doing? What are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm just kind of reading a book. And they're like, that's not a book. What are you doing? Let me see that. And then they would take it and look at it. And they're like, what is what? And wait a minute. And then they start asking questions. And so then it's like, hey, do you have any more of these? And hey, can I make a copy of this? And hey, can I show this to my wife at home? And kind of the relationship guy, you know, and and every once in a while, guys would be in relationship issues and somehow they'd be on my crew for a while. The BCs would say, hey, we're going to bring so-and-so over and be in your crew for two or three shifts. And like, okay. So I'd get together and talk to them and just talk about relationship stuff. And, you know, it was all fine and good. You know, we talk about trauma. And I think a lot of times, uh, I don't know about your listeners, but 
a lot of times people think of trauma, they think of blood and guts and, you know, just the nasty calls and something. But there's other things that happen to us first responders that happen what I call administrative stress. And what I mean by that is you might have an officer that is just not communicating well with you, like they don't know how to or something, or maybe they don't like you, or maybe there's a process that you go through. And the other thing about administrative stress is for me is my union, who I absolutely love, the International Association of Firefighters, the IFF, we were local 2545 is my local. And um, because I like I'm a relationship guy. And and I like to have people get along and smile and have a good time and, and that sort of thing. And so when I would see the strife between my union and my administration, it hurt me. And I didn't know what to do with that. And so I would just stuff it. I would just rucksack. put it in that rucksack and just, and, yep, I'd stuff it away. And I took several tests to be promoted to lieutenant. But because of my dyslexia, I didn't do well on the test. On the practical side of things... You know, when you had to, you know, assessment center. Yeah, I always did really well. I scored very, very high on those. And I even had people that would come and talk to me when an assessment was coming up and say, hey, Tim, can you help me with the assessment? Because I I knew they were going to score really well on the written, but the assessment, they needed little coaching and stuff. And it's like, I'm giving away my... (laughs) my secrets, you know, to help them. But it's okay because they were good guys and they were great officers. And so they did a good job. But I never got promoted, took several tests. There was one time where I actually had an opportunity to get promoted and they didn't choose me. They chose someone younger than me. And that hurt so bad. It hurt so bad. So what did I do with it? I stuffed it away. I just stuffed it away Mm -hmm. and I'd come home and, you know, my bride would be like, are you okay? You know, cause I'd tell her the score. I'd tell her I didn't get, you know, whatever. And I had some other situations that happened to me in the department where I went to my administration. I went to my union and they're like, Hey Tim, there's nothing we can do about this. It is what it is. And I'm like, there's a process here. I've gone through my process and I'm getting no help. I'm getting no support. And, you know, I come home, I I tell my bride and she's like, you know, and so what do I do with that? I don't want to upset her. I don't want to upset the family. So I stuff it away. So taking this stuff and stuffing it away for 40 years and probably more than that, right? But in the fire service, 40 years of the calls, of the trauma, of the other things that happened, I just stuffed it away. And before I knew it, it started coming out. And I, I didn't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was stuffing it. I didn't know it was going to come out. But one night I was at shift in 2018 and I broke out in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. Like my whole body was in a cold sweat. And I woke up and I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? What's happening to me? And so I jump up, I go take a shower, I get close, you know, I'm like freaking out. Well, then it started happening every once in a while. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? And I thought, you know, maybe I'm going through menopause or something. I don't know what's going on, you know? And so I've got the windows open, you know, in my room. Lori's like, what are you doing? Why? And I'm like, I don't know what's, you know. And then my head started racing during the day. I couldn't concentrate as well. And over the course of the next three years, I got to the point where I wasn't sleeping. It started where I couldn't sleep the night before going to work. Then it became, I couldn't sleep a night at work. Then it was two nights at work. And by the time I retired, I wasn't sleeping four nights out of the week. I couldn't sleep the night before. I couldn't sleep the two nights because we work a 48 hour shift. And then I couldn't sleep the night I got home. And it was like, I was going crazy. And my mind was going like a hundred miles an hour. And my bride is just like going, you got 30 years in, you know, and we're right in the middle of the pandemic and this whole mess and everything. And she's like, retire, you can retire. And I'm like, no, I can't retire. We've got all these new people coming in. They need me to be a a senior. I need to, you know, help these people. I've got all these stuff. I got all these responsibilities. I've got all these things going on. And she's like, you need to retire. And so I called a couple of my guys that I looked up to 
that had right retired a couple of years ago. One was a captain that I had. And I called him and, and he said, he called me Timmy. He goes, Timmy, he goes, it sounds like you need to retire. Mm. And I said, I go, Keith, I can't. I just, I, I'm just not ready. I don't want to. A week later, he was killed in an accident. Ugh. And it absolutely dropped me. It dropped Lori. It dropped our department. It dropped. I mean, it was so hard. It was, it was so, so hard. And after we got through the funeral and, you know, all that stuff, Lori came to me and she said, you're done. Mm. You're done. She goes, either you turn in the resignation or I'm turning it in for you. And that's how strong she is because she would have done it. <laughs> she had to so wrestle went, you right to the ground yep, and yep. went right over your body. Yep. Yep. She would have went right to my chief and said, he's done. <laughs> so I went in and talked to my chief and I said, look, I go, I don't know what's going on, but I go, I need to retire. I didn't explain to him. I didn't tell him why. I just said I need it. And he's like, okay, I, I get it. I understand. You know, I hate to hear it. I'd love for you to stay. You know, we got a lot of stuff going on. And I'm like, I know, but I, I have to do this. I promised Lori that I would, I would do this. So in my mind of saying I'll do this, I'm saying to myself, hey, I'll retire. Everything will go back to normal. Everything will be good. I'll be sleeping again. Lori will be happy. I'm home. We've got our seven acres, our horses out here. Everything's going to be great. And life will be great. It'll be good. Yeah. And so I'm like, here we go. Let's do this. Right. And, oh, it was so hard. And my mind was going like a hundred miles an hour. That's what I tell people. When I retired, it jumped from a hundred to a thousand. Mm. My sleep got worse. I started seeing things during the daytime. I envisioned ways of committing suicide. Mm -hmm. I started going down this dark road. I went to this hole. I fell in this hole. I went down. I went dark. It got really bad. And right about that time where I'm like, I'm ready to check out. Mm -hmm. My wife doesn't need me. My kids don't need me. They're adults. The department doesn't need me. I can't go back. You know what? I have no identity. Yeah. Right. All I've Lost been purpose. my whole entire fire department, my, my entire life has been a firefighter pretty much. I grew up in the fire department and now I'm going to pull that away from myself. What am I nuts? Mm -hmm. I'm ready. Let's do this. Yeah. And um, Stronger Families comes along. Noel Metter calls me out of the blue. I don't know who he is. I don't know what Stronger Families is. I know nothing about it. And I get this phone call and he says, you don't know me, but I got your name from someone that I know in a neighboring department. And he told me I needed to call you and talk to you. And so we talked for a while on the phone and he goes, yeah, I'm going to fly up and see you. I go, what? He goes, yeah. I go, where are you? And he goes, uh, I'm in Texas. So he flies up and he sees me and he meets me and talks to me about stronger families. He goes, I want you to take this home. I want you to show your wife this. I want you to look through this material. I want you to tell me what you think of it. I'll be back in a week. <sighs> okay. And so I told my bride, I said, hey, there's this guy. He called me. He, said he wants to meet me. He's going to meet me right here in town. And she's like, what? No, you don't sign anything. You don't okay. say yes to anything. You don't give him any money. You don't tell him anything. <laughs> Like, we don't okay. want a timeshare. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Or some, like, you know, some multi-marketing, you know, thing right. or something. And so we read through the material and we're just like, oh my gosh. And so now she gets online and she's looking it up, you know, stronger is families. What is this? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Right. Yep. The whole thing. And she's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. She goes, they do all this stuff for the military. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. I was never in the military. They didn't want me, by the way. Mm. They said I was too tall. Too I had tall. too big of feet and uh, probably too big of a target, I guess, is what I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing. But I was all in. I wanted to go to the military. I, I wanted They'd to, have to dig to the uh, trenches. They'd yeah. have to dig several more inches to be able to yeah. fit you in it. And yeah, it was exactly. Yes. Yeah. That'd be very inconvenient for everyone, right? Because they have to dig right, deeper. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I have a real heart for the military and I love working with guys that were in the military. Um, anyway, so Lori's doing all this research. She's like, yeah, you're going to go back and meet this guy. I'm like, okay. 
So I go back and, and I sign meet again. something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know about signing anything, but um, <laughs> Not yet. I said, Hey, look, I'm retired. We're okay. And you know, I can help. I don't, I don't know how you would use me, but if I can help the military, I'm in. He's like, no, Tim, you don't understand. And I'm like, okay. He goes, we want this material to go out to first responders. Mm -hmm. And I go, what? And we want you to facilitate that. And I go, what? No, you do not want me. And then that started a course of interviews. And every time I ended my interview, I said, no, you do not want to hire me. You want to hire someone that's a battalion chief, someone that is was a sheriff or, you know, someone with somebody that's important. And, and in the midst um, of it, you're also struggling with all of this darkness going on in the back exactly, of your mind. Exactly. Like, I don't have the rank yep. and you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what I can Exactly. Yeah. And you already are thinking it's time to go. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. idea of committing to something mm -hmm. probably felt very like a facade, like a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Not like fake, but. Imposter. But yeah, fake. An imposter, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. oh, I'm going to go out and do all these healthy family things while I'm getting ready to leave mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I talked to my bride about it. And she said, you know, maybe you should really think about this. And we had another interview and it was with the team. And they said, hey, we'd really like to offer you the job. And I'm like, thank you, but no, thank you. And they said, would you tell us why? And I said, honestly, you, you want the honest truth? And they said, yeah. And I go, because, and, and I started crying. I said, because I am physically hurting. My body hurts. My spiritual body is broken. Mm -hmm. My mental body is broken. And you don't want to take this on. Mm -hmm. And they didn't say a word. They just were speechless. And I got up and I walked out. And I came home and I talked to my bride and, and she said, well, what, how'd it go? And I said, I told him, I said, you don't want me. And this is why you don't want me. And she cried. And I mean, it's just this whole thing, right? Well, of course they called back and They're they like, said, challenge accepted. Here we, we come. are not, we are not <laughs> letting you go. You are going to do this. So then my bride and I said, okay, let's try it for a year. We'll try it for a year and see what happens. And I had no idea what I was doing. And so I meet with Noel and he's like, hey, what do you think we should do? How do we get this out there? And I had heard of Sean Thomas in first responder conferences. And I mm -hmm. said, hey, there's this organization. And so we talked about it. And so we called Sean and said, hey, Sean, this is what Stronger Families is. And I'm new to the show, but you know, this is what it's about. And do you think this would fit? And she's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Family stuff? Yes. Come on. And so again, I didn't know anything. I'm just a knucklehead. And Noel is the one that wrote this material. He and his wife, Carissa, wrote the oxygen curriculum. And so mm -hmm. he's on the stage presenting this information. And I'm like, standing there, you know, <laughs> throwing in a few words here and there as a first responder. But I'm going to these conferences. I'm going to these first responder health and wellness conferences that Sean does. And I'm blown away. Because people are telling stories about their PTS and they're talking about stress and they're talking about, you know, all these different things. And next thing I know, I'm freaking crying at the table. I'm sitting at the Stronger Family table representing Stronger Families and I'm crying. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Mm -hmm. What is going on? And it took about three of these conferences that I went to with her. And I'm like, I came home to Lori and I said, I think I have PTSD. I don't really understand it. I don't know. You know, I go, but everything they're talking about, I, I am going through, I'm feeling. And so, of course, what does she do? Boom. Right Google to the internet. Up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Search it up. Facebook, you know, Instagram, everything, right? She's into everything. And she's reading this stuff. She's like, yes, yes, this is you. This is you. This is you. This is you. You know, and so we're trying to deal with this stuff. And I still in denial, I'm like, no, I don't have that. Other guys have that. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. And so then it came down to a fight. Her and I got in a fight one day. And usually when we get in an argument, it was she would walk away or I'd walk away and we'd cool off and come back and reconnect and, and it, everything would be okay. 
But this time I could not let her walk away. And she walked all the way out to the barn and I followed her all the way out to the barn and she's crying and yelling and slamming barn doors and all kinds of stuff like that. And I wouldn't walk away from her. And she's like, why can't you give me space? And one of the things she said was, she says, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm done. And she kept using the word I'm done. And it just kept hitting me in the head over and over. Done. Done. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm done. This is it. I'm done. And she looked at me and she goes, what? And I go, I'm done. She says, what do you mean by that? And so then I told her, I said, I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to check out. And she's like, what? And so then we started talking, right. And that brought her down, brought me down. She goes, we're going to the doctor. Good. So she took me to the doctor. The doctor happened to be a veteran who hears my story. Cause what do you do when you walk into the doctor's office, right? It's a walk-in clinic. You know, why are you here? Oh, I'm thinking of shooting myself in the head. You know, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm at wit's end. I don't know what to do. I need some help. And they're like, okay. So I go to talk to this doctor and I start telling my story to this doctor. And he starts crying mm. and I start crying and we cried together. And he goes, I'm sorry, I'm emotional with you here. He goes, you don't need that. He goes, I, I'm like, no, he goes, I have PTSD. He goes, you have PTSD, Tim. He goes, you've been in this situation your whole entire life and you don't know it. And he said, this is what you have. You can get through this. I can help you. I can, you know, we started with some medicine and, you know, all that kind of stuff. He goes, the first thing we got to do is we got to help you get some sleep. He goes, you're not sleeping four or five nights, six nights out of the week, you know, or you're getting maybe two hours of sleep. He goes, that's not healthy. He goes, you're, you're dying. He goes, you don't know it, but you're dying. And he goes, we need to help you. And so he gave some medications and that kind of got the ball going. Meanwhile, I'm learning more about stronger families as I'm trying to, you know, work, <laughs> trying to work for them. And a buddy of mine that I was working with in stronger families came to me and he says, Hey dude, you need to go to this place called Mighty Oaks. And I said, what? And he's like, yeah, it's Mighty Oaks. It's a week long thing. You go to it. It's for first responders. It's free all this kind of stuff. And so I contacted him and I went, it's a, um, I don't know if you've heard of, of Mighty Oaks, but I was just going to ask you where, uh, is it like Save a Warrior? It's like Save a Warrior. It's a Christian organization and it's all about basically learning about the Bible and they have what's called the four B's and it's to be in the word, be in prayer, be in fellowship with other guys that are going through what you're going through, and then also be in a healthy church. And they call them the four B's. And it's a nonprofit organization. It's a week-long thing. There was guys there. And that's where I really learned about this abuse prior to the age of 12, mm. because they kind of talked about it a little bit. And then as these guys are telling their stories, there's like 40 of us there. And I'm kidding you not. There must have been 30 of them that said they were sexually abused as kids. I was blown away. These are guys that were veterans. These were guys that were active military. These are guys who were firefighters. These guys were police officers. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, it blew my mind. It just blew my mind. And it was a week long thing. They fed you amazing food. I mean, it was absolutely amazing and just a great organization. And I felt good. I've had a relationship with the Lord ever since I was a little kid, but it really helped me spiritually get things kind of lined up again. And I highly recommend it. I have a good buddy of mine that works there. He, you know, they, they get guys to go in there and be kind of the leaders, if you will. And he's one of the leaders now. And uh, he's the one that told me to, hey, Tim, you need to check this out. So I went and did it. I came home. I felt really good. And I felt like, yeah, okay, I'm better. I'm, I'm ready to go. But after about a month, and I did, I did the four Bs, man. I was doing everything. But after about a month, I could feel myself slipping back into that dark hole again. It scared the living bejeebies out of me, man. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, no, I went there before. I don't want to go there again. Something's not right. 
And there was this guy named Matt Quackenbush. I don't know if you guys have heard of him yet. Not yet. But he is, he's kind of like you guys. And he has a podcast as well. And he was speaking at a 1RC. I just want to say his last name. Yeah, Quackenbush, Matt Quackenbush. He's actually getting his doctorate degree right now in PTSD for first responders. I mean, he really, really wants to help first responders. He's really, really just the coolest dude. You'd love him. You guys would love him. He was speaking at one of the 1RCs. And I've learned so much going to these 1RCs, you guys. I love going to them. I learned so much. And I've been able to go with Sean for about two years and her team. It's just been amazing. But Matt was one of the guys that I got to listen to. And he spoke in a way that I just connected with this guy. And even though he's not a first responder, I connected with him. It was was like he understood me. And I came home and I told Lori, I said, I don't know who this guy is, but I need to listen to him more. I need to talk, you know, and it was kind of a, a weird thing. But I just, I just had this connection. Well, I went to another one. I went to another one RC, and he was there again. And I went and talked to him. I finally went and talked to him. I said, "Look, you don't know who I am." I go, "I'm one of the presenters, but I need to talk to you." And we started talking, and I kind of gave him my story a little bit. And he's like, "Tim, you need to go to Deer Hollow. You need to go to Utah. You need to go for 45 days, and you need to go through this treatment." And I said, I can't, I work for stronger families. And he's like, just, you got to do this. So I went and I talked to Noel. I told him what was going on. I explained to him more about what's going on up here in my brain and where I'm at and what things have happened and transpired. I told him about the thing with Lori and I and all that. And he's like, dude, what do you need? Let's figure it out. Let's do this. And I said, let me go back and talk to Matt again. So I went and talked to Matt and he's like, okay, if you can't do the 45 day treatment, He goes, can you do an intensive outpatient treatment? It's called IOP, intensive outpatient treatment. And I said, what is that? And he goes, well, we get on Zoom. We meet three times a week. We meet for three hours. We talk about PTS and how to deal with that stress and how to understand it, Mm. how to understand that you're not going crazy and that this is normal. You're reacting normal to abnormal circumstances. Mm And what are the tools to help you get through this? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, it's a three-hour deal each session, three times a week, and it's six weeks long. Can you commit to that? And it's for first responders. And I said, yeah, I'm in. So I just want to interject because I think this is so important because we know that the hierarchy of those who listen to us is varied. So I want to ask you, what did it mean to you? To have Noel say, we'll do whatever we need to for you to be able to take care of yourself and be healthy. Oh, sure. We know that there's a lot of you call it administrative stress, and I usually refer to it as politics. And <sighs> one of those things that we see experienced in leadership is the fear of abuse and being duped. And so what that oftentimes results in is leadership not taking good care of their people. And they're so consumed with people not abusing time that it leaves a very poor experience for those who really need it and get that same guarded reaction. And so I'm glad I asked because clearly it's meant something to you. But I think that because we are so, especially right, our leadership are also first responders and you guys are trained to identify Mm -hmm. the threat. And so you are always looking for that person that is trying to get one over on the system. And so I wanted to hone in on this opportunity for them to be able to hear from somebody who their response they got from someone in leadership was, I see you, I hear you, I want you to be well, and we will do whatever it takes to allow you to do what you need to do to be well. Yeah. um,
it is such a, um, this has been such a journey. Um, this has been such a journey and I'm still on it, right? I'm still, I tell people I'm still, I'm still on this journey. Thank you for joining us for the first half of At the Core of 44. Please be sure to tune in next week to hear more about Tim's journey, recovery, the tools he uses to keep his mental wellness in the forefront, and how his work with stronger families not only gave him his own life back, but is helping so many other first responders and their families. If you or someone you know is struggling with their mental health or is having suicidal ideation, please know you are not alone and there are many folks out there to help. We understand that this is a lonely and scary place to be. We have many first responder resources on our website at afterthetonesdrop.com. Just click the resources tab. We are also constantly adding more as we learn about them. Be safe. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of After the Tones Drop. Today's show has been brought to you by Whole House Counseling. As a note, After the Tones Drop is for informational purposes only and does not constitute for medical or psychological advice. It is not a substitute for professional health care advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please contact a local mental health professional in your area if you are in need of any assistance. You can also visit afterthetonesdrop.com and click on our resources tab for an abundance of helpful information. And we would like to give a very special thank you and shout out to Vens Adams, Yeti, and Sonda for our show's music.